Good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you all today? Great. My name is Gail Osterberg. I'm the Director of Communications for the Library of Congress. We work really hard for months to put this program together for you, and so it's really exciting when you come into an auditorium and see people who are here and excited to hear from our authors and, and spend a great day with maybe finding some new authors, some new books, and celebrating reading. So thank you all so much for being here. I want to also take a minute to say a big thank you to our festival sponsors. This event not only would not be free, but it just wouldn't happen at all without the generosity of many sponsors, David Rubenstein, the Washington Post, the Institute for Museum and Library Services, as well as Wells Fargo and many others. Many of our sponsors are exhibiting down on the expo floor, so if you have a minute today, please go down there and say thank you for their support of reading and of this great event. I would also invite you to consider donating yourself. Um, it's very easy, loc.gov forward slash donate. No contribution is too small and it will help ensure that this event can continue in the future. One of those sponsors downstairs is PBS, and I would also like to make you aware of a new series that they will be rolling out this fall called The Great American Read. They did a wonderful launch episode with host Meredith Vieira earlier this year. They surveyed readers like yourselves across the country and came up with a list of America's 100 favorite novels and are encouraging you to read those throughout the summer and to vote for your favorites. And then this fall, there will be a great series highlighting some of the different um, books on the list and counting down the favorite uh, novels that folks have voted on throughout the summer. So I encourage you to take part in that wonderful activity. Now, our next author, I'm always so interested to hear about the backgrounds of some of the folks that, that are writers today. Um, they're all extraordinary authors, um, but also just really extraordinary and interesting people. And our next author is an investigative reporter whose work has resulted in new laws, criminal convictions, and millions in restitution for victims and consumers. Her journalism has been awarded more than 30 Emmys and 14 Edward R. Murrow Awards. And that's before we even get to her books. Her two series, the Charlotte McNally series and the Jane Ryland and Jake Brogan thrillers are national bestsellers. She is the winner of five Agathas and the Mary Higgins Clark Award. Her brand new book, which she is launching here at the National Book Festival from Forge Books, is called Trust Me. Has anyone had a chance to read it yet? Um, trust me when I tell you that this book is a mind twist of the first order. I could not put it down. Um, another best-selling author described it as grief and deception are at the helm of Ryan's latest thriller in which a crime writer and an accused criminal's lives collide as they come to discover that no one can be trusted, not even oneself. It is a book about the truth which, to quote one passage, takes three forms. What we think it is, how someone presents it to us, and what it really is. I can't wait to hear her talk about this book. Please welcome, for her National Book Festival debut appearance, Hank Philippi Ryan. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming here. This is absolutely great. I love coming to Washington, D.C. I lived here in the 70s, um, working on Capitol Hill for the Senate Judiciary Committee subcommittee and for Rolling Stone magazine. Um, so I always seem to come here at interesting times, right? Um, I've been a television reporter for 43 years, the first year in Indianapolis and then for a while in Atlanta, and for the past 33 years, I can't believe it, um, in Boston. I've wired myself with hidden cameras, I've confronted corrupt politicians, I've gone undercover and in disguise, but I didn't always plan to be a reporter. I grew up in really rural Indiana, so rural that you couldn't see another house from our house, and I used to ride my pony to the library to get books. And I would fill up the saddlebags with books and then read up in the hayloft of the barn behind our house. 
And that's where I fell in love with the mystery. I read Nancy Drew, you read Nancy Drew, right? The clue in the old clock and the clue in the diary. Um, which I thought was clue in the dairy for most of the book. And I kept thinking, you know, shouldn't there be cows? I don't know. It was fine. And then my parents lost me for about a month when I was up in the hayloft reading every single Sherlock Holmes short story and novella. And then I went on to, yeah, and then I went on to the Golden Age of Mysteries, Niall Marsh and Josephine Tay and Dorothy Sayers and, of course, Agatha Christie. And that's why I really fell in love with the mystery, with the architecture of that kind of a novel where a smart author could lure you in and keep you turning the pages and then in the end surprise you and have you say, oh, I should have seen that coming. But the author was smarter than I am. So I always wanted to be a mystery author or a detective. And as an investigative reporter and a crime fiction author, I guess I am a little bit of each. My life did not go the way it was planned. I was in college. I was a Shakespeare major, uh, much to my parents' chagrin. My mom was like, oh, honey, you know, you are never going to be able to get a job. You know, you're unemployable. And then after college, I went to work in several political campaigns back home in Indiana. Sadly, not one candidate I ever worked for actually won. <laughs> so this is one of those moments when you, the universe is sort of telling you, find another career. <laughs> so I decided that my new career would be in journalism. So I went to the biggest radio station in Indianapolis, and I went to the news director, and I said, I'm here to apply for the job as a reporter. And he proceeded to ask me all about my experience in radio and television and journalism, which was zero. At which point he said, um, I'm so sorry, you know, you seem like a perfectly fine young woman, but I just can't hire you. You have absolutely no experience whatsoever. He said, but look, can you just give me one good reason? This was 1970, I should rem remind you. Uh, he said, can you give me one good reason why I should hire you? And I said, well, yeah, you know, I can, actually. I said, um, your license is up for renewal at the FCC right now, and you don't have any women working here. And then I just smiled. And the next day, I had my first job in broadcasting. I know. It's, I know. When you're 20, when you're 20, you know, you're much more brave than you are when you, when you realize that people are going to tell you no. But I started writing fiction. I've been a television reporter ever since. I started writing fiction about 10 years ago um, when I just had a good idea. You know that feeling when you have a good idea and you get goosebumps and you think, wow, this is going to work. And I went home and I said to my husband, sweetheart, I'm going to write the novel I've always wanted to write. I have a good idea for a mystery. And Johnson says, great. Do you know how, honey, to write a novel? And I'm like, how hard can it be? You know, I've read a million of these. So I soon realized, of course, how hard it could be. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with my 10th novel, my first standalone, a psychological standalone, which came out really two days ago. So I'm so excited to share that with you. Now, you know about elevator pitches, right? You know what that is. They tell you that if you find yourself in an elevator with Steven Spielberg, and he pushes 25, and you have 25 floors with him, and he says, what's your book about? That you better be able to tell him. So the, if I were in an elevator with you, that'd be weird, because it's big. <laughs> um, if I were in an elevator with you, I would tell you that Trust Me is one obsessed journalist, one buzzsaw, can you hear that next door? That Trust Me is one obsessed journalist, one troubled mom, and they face off in a high-stakes cat and mouse game to prove their truth about a gruesome and terrible murder. The question is, which one is the cat and which one is the mouse? And I dare you to find the liar. Now, let me show you a cool thing about that. In looking for the liar, I mean, I love the cover of Trust Me. It's beautiful, right? But if you look at it this way, See what it says? Can you see that it says liar? Is that so great? <laughs> right? Isn't that cool? Somebody's really smart. So yeah, it's very cool. So let me tell you a little bit about where Trust Me came from. First, let me tell you that my husband Jonathan and I don't celebrate the anniversary of the day we met. 
We celebrate the anniversary of the day before we met, and we call that You Never Know Day, because you never know what wonderful thing is around the next corner. And isn't that kind of true, you know, on the days that you're disappointed or unhappy, and you think, oh my goodness, I'm doomed, and nothing good is ever going to happen to me again? How often does it happen that something wonderful happens right after that, out of the adversity of that? And that is precisely how Trust Me was born, another you never know day. Remember the Casey Anthony trial? You do, right? You remember that, the notorious Florida party girl mom who was accused of the murder of her young daughter, of hiding the body and then lying about it for a month. Well, here's an inside scoop. I was hired back then by a big fancy publishing company to write the narrative nonfiction of the Casey Anthony trial. It was gonna be a big bestseller if all went as planned. And you know how often that happens. So I had to have the book done on the day that Casey Anthony was sentenced to life in prison because of course that was exactly what was going to happen. And my deadline was fierce because I only had started writing as the trial began. So I worked like a crazy person. I had three computers going at the same time, one for watching the trial, one for researching the background and history and family story of Casey Anthony and the Anthony family, and one for writing. One for viewing, one for researching, and one for writing. And I worked all the time. I worked a million hours a day. It had to be fascinating and brilliant and insightful and thoughtful, but it, and it had to be done on time. There was no question about that. Now here's a confession as I wrote. Here's a confession as I wrote, I was thinking, this is really good. <laughs> that was doomed. I loved writing it. It was so enthralling. I got to tell a true story like I do in my TV stories, but because I had more time and space in the book, it could be bigger and deeper and richer, still with every fact correct, but with every suspenseful turning point. But in this book, unlike television, I also got to talk about how people were thinking and what they were planning and what their motivations were. So it was perfect. I got to use my TV skills to take a lot of complicated stuff and make it fascinating and interesting and compelling, and my fiction writing skills to make a page turner of a story with a big crime, with stranger than fiction characters, and endless suspense. In fact, just to reveal a little bit more ridiculously personal stuff, I thought I had found my calling. You know how it feels when you're really into something? Uh, I, I will confess to you that I thought, this is going to be the next In Cold Blood. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write narrative nonfiction. I rock this. And here, here's even another admission. I wrote the outline. I wrote the, ver the outline for the verdict scene before the verdict even happened. I was that confident about what was going to happen in the trial. I thought that's gonna be so easy because she is so guilty. Well, you know what happened next, right? She was acquitted. And boom, my book was killed. Publisher called, said, thank you so much, but no thank you, we don't need that now. Thanks for all your hard work and goodbye. Can you believe that? Now. As the wife of a criminal defense attorney, I had to say, good, you know, the system worked again. That's what's supposed to happen. But as the rest of me, that profoundly affected me. That experience profoundly changed me. And here's why. I realized a couple of things. Once I, one, I realized that that jury had somehow taken a story I thought I knew and come up with the exact opposite opinion of what had actually happened. How could that be that two sets of facts could be thought of in exactly opposite ways? How could my way have been so wrong? And then, and also as affecting, I realized that I had been writing this true crime book from the perspective that she was guilty. And I really hadn't thought about it that way. I believed she was, so what I was writing was true because it was true for me. Now that was actually kind of upsetting because of course I thought I was writing it from a perfectly objective point of view. And then I thought, and stay with me here because this is the brain of someone whose book had just been killed. 
I, I thought, what if I, what if I was right? What if I actually had written the true story, but the jury, based on the evidence that they had, just disagreed with me? Could there be two truths? And then I realized there are three sides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth. So the manuscript got cost, tossed, and I chalked that up to experience, and my life went on. But then part two happened. My darling husband, Jonathan, was the defense attorney in a really notorious murder case in Boston, the Bella Bond case, you may have heard of it. Um, it was called the Baby Doe Trial for a while because they couldn't identify the body of the little girl whose body was tossed in Boston Harbor in a garbage bag. The night, the night before closing arguments, I listened to Jonathan, my husband, practice what he would say, what he would tell the jury. And as, I, as he told the story, I nodded in total agreement. His client, the child's mother's boyfriend, had been accused of the murder. But the facts, as Jonathan told them, were so compelling and so convincing and so true, it was so clear to me, and it was so evident as Jonathan talked, that his client was not guilty at all. Absolutely not guilty. And I said to him, sweetheart, this is a slam dunk acquittal. And then I thought about the prosecutor's wife across town, sitting at their kitchen table. And she was listening to her prosecutor husband give his closing arguments, practice his closing arguments. And of course, in that closing argument, he'd select the facts that would create a completely different story, a story of guilt. And did his wife, I wonder, turn to him and say, oh, sweetheart, slam dunk conviction. Did she do that? And how, that, how could that be? And it was so thought provoking to me, the question of justice and truth and how the same set of facts can be used in two different ways to come up with two completely different stories about the same terrible crime. And was either of them true? Three sides to every story, yours, mine, and the truth. So here's how my writer brain worked on that. Could I, I wonder, write a thriller where two different people tell polar opposite stories with polar opposite explanations about the exact same murder using exactly and only the same facts, but come up with different truths? That would be such fun, such a great challenge to write, wouldn't it? It would be so important too, I thought, to reveal how our biases and emotions color our truths. There's what we're told is true. There's what we believe is true. And then there's the truth. And I loved that idea so much. So Rubik's cubing all, those, all that stuff into my story, here's how my writer brain worked on that. I have a young magazine writer, Mercer Hennessy, who lives in a suburb of Boston called Linsdale, which I made up. She's left her burgeoning career as a journalist to stay home with her new young daughter and her beloved husband. She's decided to give up her career for her family. When there's a tragic accident, and this happens on page one, her family is taken away. She is so sad, she is so bereaved, she is so full of grief that she cannot think of a reason to get out of bed in the morning. She even considers burning down their house just to be done with it all because life has no meaning and no reason anymore for her. In fact, she starts her day by writing numbers in the condensation, the steam condensation of the mirror of the bathroom. And as the book opens, she writes four, four, two in the mirror. That's how many days it's been since her family was taken from her. That's her ritual. But then as the story opens, more than a year later, Mercer is offered the assignment that might bring her back into the real world to write a true crime narrative of a riveting trial about a gruesome, terrible murder. The defendant is a young woman named Ashlyn Bryant. And the book that Mercer Hennessy writes and her is her personal story, as well as the defendant's story, and that becomes the crucial cat and mouse of this book. 
Who's telling the truth? And what is the truth? And how do you write a true crime novel? Uh, how do you write a true crime narrative if you don't know the truth? So Mercer decides to use all of her reporter skills to get the story that she wants. And is that a good thing? Because Mercer has some secrets of her own. And I was really honored to be featured on Boston's NPR the other day. And the, um, the person who interviewed me on the radio asked me to read a little bit of my book. And I never do that. I have never done uh, a seminar or a session where I actually read. But she, the cool part was that she picked the sections she wanted me to read, very tiny. And I was so impressed with that that I'm going to do that now, too. Um, First, here's the first page. It's actually not the first page. It's actually pre-page one. So you can sort of get a sense of how the book feels. This is the beginning of Trust Me. Using one forefinger, I write on the bathroom mirror, drawing through the steamy condensation left by the shower. This morning's number is 442. 442 days since the car accident that destroyed my family, the crash that took Dex and Sophie from me, the numbers disintegrate as I write them. They melt into watery tears, and then they disappear. I would give anything, anything. I would do anything. Longing, unbitten, hits me hard, unwanted, as I look at my reflection. We make these offers every day, filling in our own personal blanks. If you make this happen, we promise, I'll give up drinking or speeding, or whatever. If you give me what I want, I'll be a better daughter, a more reliable husband, a more devoted wife. Make my wish come true, and I'll do anything. We bargain, negotiate, make deals with the universe. Eventually, certainly, inevitably, we'll get what we want. And then the universe laughs, and we are left to bargain with ourselves. And as the story progresses, Mercer is covering the trial of Ashlyn Bryant. And the jury goes out, and she's waiting for the verdict. And this is a tiny bit of what happens to her as she's finished her book and is waiting for the verdict. Don't you people have a brain? I yell at the blank court monitor screen. Day five of deliberations, almost over. No questions, no nothing, not a peep for five full days. I've sat at my desk writing like crazy and fueled by coffee and saltines and wine, going nuts. What the hell is that jury doing? It means there's a holdout, one local cable commentator pontificated this morning. You know nothing, I answered the television. There was no proven cause of death, another suit agreed. So the hell what? I debated him too, jabbing at him with a finger. Dead is dead, and it was no accident. That child was in a trash bag. Moreover, I console myself, eating my salty cracker. It's definitely possible that a guilty verdict is in the making. Jurors don't want to convict some, someone, especially for a crime that carries a life sentence, without appearing to meticulously consider all the evidence. But the guilt, guilty verdict could come any second. Jurors took two days to convict Jody Arias of killing an ex-boyfriend, four days to convict the Menendez brothers of killing their parents, 11 days to convict Scott Peterson of killing his wife Lacey and their unborn child. On the other hand, that idiot Florida jury only took about two hours to acquit Casey Anthony, to acquit O.J. Simpson less than four hours, four hours. So a long deliberation has to mean a guilty verdict, I deeply relish that Ashlyn must know that too. So that's how, that's how the book feels. And in writing this book, well, let me just tell you, I tried to find a cat and mouse passage of the book to read so you could see how Ashlyn and Mercer deal with each other. But there was not one exchange that does not give away a clue in the book. So you'll just have to read that for yourself and have the fun of making your own decisions about who's telling the truth. And you know, I followed my own advice, my own realization when I was writing this book. I had no idea who was guilty. I had no idea who was telling the truth as I typed chapter one. 
It was all a surprise, and a pretty amazing one, too. You know, I don't use an outline as I'm writing my novels. I just start with this one good idea, what is the essence of truth, and what about a cat and mouse game between a journalist and a troubled mom, and I type chapter one, and I just see what happens next. So I don't know what happens until I write the next line, and the next sentence, and the next paragraph, and the next scene. And that's one of the things that takes me to the computer every day, is that I cannot wait to see what happens next. So when people say, wow, the ending of Trust Me, that really surprised me. I'm like, yeah, wasn't that a surprise? You know, talk about a surprise ending. I surprise myself, and I surprise myself every day, and it's one of the things that keeps me writing. Let me ask you, let me ask you, are any of you Game of Thrones fans? It doesn't, yes, it doesn't matter if you say yes or no, but let me tell you this. I met the author George R.R. R. Martin at the Thriller Fest convention a couple of weeks ago. And after I got over my fangirl terror, I went up to him and I said, I think about you every day. <laughs> and he's like, really? How, how come? And I mean, I could have put it a little more artfully if I hadn't been so nervous, but OK. So I said, here's why. I said, because you are so brave. You'll do anything in your novels. You'll change everything. You'll make the good guys bad and the bad guys good, and you'll have terrible secrets, and you'll kill anyone. You'll kill anyone. You're not afraid to take a risk, I told him. And that's why I, when I'm writing, every day I say to myself, what would George do? Go for it, and I go for it. And he beamed at me, and we got a memorable picture together. And that's what Trust Me is. Trust Me is a big risk. My other books are series. So the reader knows no matter what happens in those books, with Jane Ryland as the main character, the reader knows no matter what happens in those books, Jane Ryland is not going to die, right? Because she has to come back for book six and seven. <laughs> so the suspense in the series comes from the really interesting and compelling story that she is working on and the murder case that she has to solve. But the, your fear is not that she's going to die. That's a, a given. But in a standalone like Trust Me, it's one and done. It's not an exciting, interesting moment in somebody's life or career. It is the biggest, most compelling, most tectonic, plate-shifting, most life-changing thing that has ever happened or will ever happen to the main characters. It will ever happen. It is one and done. That's all. And anything could happen. So in writing this standalone, my first, that was the revelation, that anything could happen. Every card could be put on the table, and some shocked the heck out of me. Anyone could be guilty. Anyone could lie and anyone could die, because nobody has to come back for book two, <laughs> right? Bookless starred review just called it a knockout, first-rate psychological suspense. And wonderful reviewer Lisa Holstein, a, a fabulous librarian, called it this, she says, it's this summer's gone girl, but I like it better. So that's good, I mean, that's good. Um, you know, I'm really the poster child for following your dreams in midlife. I didn't start writing thrillers, I didn't start writing fiction until I was 55, which was 13 years ago. Um, and I really, at a time when I'd had a wonderful career as a television reporter, I'd had some success at age 55 sometimes when people say, well, it's fine, you've had a great life, sit back, rest on your whatever laurels, and just relax. But that little girl in the hayloft wanted to write mysteries, and I wanted to do it, and I wanted to feel like that. And I'm really the living proof that it's never too late to follow your dreams about what you want to do. And if you take nothing from this morning, except my book, which is out <laughs> now, if you take, okay, that was cheap, wasn't it? But if you take nothing from this morning, um, I want you to understand that, think about what it is that you'd like to do. Did, did you want to write a novel or write narrative nonfiction or write a book of poetry or put together that recipe book that your family has been clamoring for or teach someone to read or do something good or try, take a trip or learn a new language or explore your life somehow? I'm the proof that it's never too late to do that. Do you, you know the Stephen Sondheim musical Sunday in the Park with George? You know that. It's 
a fabulous musical about the fresh French Impressionist Pointillist painter George Seurat. And there's a scene in this there's a scene in this musical where the Seurat character comes out on the stage by himself, and he has a blank sketch pad. And on this sketch pad, he draws a hat. And he looks at the sketch pad and says, look, I, I made a hat where there never was a hat. And he's, it's this realization that he has created something out of nothing. And he sings a song about it, which I will not sing. A, a song about creativity and a, so and a song about imagination and a song about how we as human beings are the only creatures who can do that. We're the only ones who can make something out of nothing but our own imagination and our own compulsion and our own obsession and our own creativity and our own brain power. We can make art and music and poetry and literature. We're the only creatures who can do that. And that's what I do every day at my computer. I'm making hats. I'm making new hats. I'm making making new worlds that only I can create that come out of nothing but my own imagination. And then you can meet Mercer and Ashlyn, characters who I have created and who become real because of that. That is the astonishing power of creativity. Um, and we embrace it. And I, it is my dream to live in this world of books and learning and writing and creativity. When I, when I, when I, finished, when I finished my, when I finished Trust Me, I called my husband into the room, and I said, sweetheart, watch this. And I typed the end. And then I burst into tears. I burst into tears, because I knew no matter what happened after that, I had taken a risk. I had written this book that I wanted to write. I had done something important. I had done something big. I had done something different. And I had followed my dream. But of course, I shouldn't have burst into tears when I typed the end, because it wasn't the end at all. It was the beginning of this wonderful new second half of my life and career. And I'm so pleased that you came here today to share that with me. Thank you so much. And we, oh my goodness, thank you. Thank you. That's a, I, I'm very honored to be here. This is quite fantastic. We do have time for questions. If you have any questions, Inc do not ask why my name is Hank. That's, you know, this I cannot talk about that. Yes. Oh, he's going to ask why my name is Hank. I knew it. Okay. Yes. No, I'm going to I'm going to follow up on your your request that we use our imagination. Uh, when I was on Capitol Hill, I I worked on a. a uh, a law to get the foreign bank account question on the tax return. That's the question Paul Manafort uh, a answered dishonestly. But there's a great story behind it, and it involves wealthy business people, it involves the Chicago mob, the Cleveland mob, equal opportunity prostitutes, one's Caucasian, one's Latin. But there's a lot of impediments to uh, my writing that book. First of all, my writing's all legal briefs. And I can't write, I can't write uh, dialogue. Let me ask you about this. So you're writing a book about your experiences on Capitol Hill um, and in, with the really complicated world of banking and finances. And that's, you have a very special thing. And we all, and I promise you I'll get to your question. We all have a very special thing. Any of us who wants to write a book or even who thinks about that a little bit in their head. We, you know something that nobody else knows. You know things that are special. And you have to ask yourself, and I ask myself this every day as I'm writing, why do I care about this? Why do I care about this? Because if I don't care, the reader won't care. How do I make the reader care? So if I, if I had to give you advice about how to write a complicated book and you say, oh, I can't write dialogue and I don't know how to, and it's a very complicated topic, I say, yeah, isn't that great? Sit down at your computer and Type chapter one and see what story you're telling. And at every moment, ask yourself, why is this important? What difference does it make? And how can I advance this story? And what is my goal? 
Don't worry about, I mean, it's interesting because the idea of writing a novel is incredibly daunting. You know, you sit at your computer and you think, I have to write a novel, this is impossible. But you're writing a page, you're writing a paragraph. Just try that. Tell yourself, I'm just going to write one paragraph and then I'm going to get up. See if you can do that, and I bet you can. And after you write that one paragraph, write another one. And then when you get your first draft done, worry about making the dialogue better and worry about the plot holes and worry about all that. But you, you can't write a book by just thinking about it. Dennis Lehane always talks, says that he thinks about writing his novel so much that when he comes home, he can't understand why the manuscript isn't longer because <laughs> that feels like he's been working on it. So that's what I would say. Is it possible to work with, a, with an author that, that's a published author that could make this into a real story? Is it possible to work with a published author that could make it into a story? Is this just a casual question? <laughs> hey, I'm we'll talk Kelsey. afterwards. Only you can write the story that you can write. Um, there are writing teachers and there are editors, and we'll talk, off, we'll talk after this program is over. Thank Sounds you. like a good book. See, you know, there's always something. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm a college student, and I'm also really interested in writing mystery novels. And like, there are a lot of things that you said, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm thinking of the same thing. Um, so, from a more experienced perspective, what were what was one or more things that you learned about writing mysteries as you wrote a lot of mysteries that you maybe not didn't know when you started? What are some things I learned about writing mysteries that I may not have known when I started? You know what the really the big thing is? How difficult it is and how full of self-doubt every writer is. I mean, you heard Annie, Annie Poole last night said, Annie Poole stood up on the stage and said, I don't really feel like a writer. And I thought, wow, you know, if she has doubts, everybody has doubts. Tess Gerritsen once told me, with every book I hand in, I wonder if this is the one where people will realize I'm a fraud and I don't really know what I'm doing. Tess Gerritsen. So, if you, are, if you don't have doubts, um, you're probably not being very realistic about what you're writing. And if you think, wow, this is very difficult, then pat yourself on the back, because that means you're working hard. That means you're a writer. Pat yourself on the back for going for it. The thing that will stop any writer is that just de depressing darkness of worry that you're not good enough. You know, that, that's... Um, don't do that. Just throw that away. Just go for it because you'll never know what book you have until you do it. And worrying isn't going to make it go, happen any faster. And it will, make, it will make your life be much more dismal. So embrace your writing. Go for it. And don't worry. It will turn out fine. I promise. It's a Hank promise. It will turn out fine. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Um, as just considering from a writing perspective, do you think it would be better or advantageous to be living with a prosecutor versus a defense attorney? <laughs> do I think it would be better to live, be living with a prosecutor or defense attorney from the standpoint of writing just a novel? Writing. Yes. Two hilarious things about that. And that is the funniest question I've ever heard, and you'll hear why. One is, I can't write in the morning. If I, you know, I have colleagues who get up in, at the crack of dawn and write. And if I did that, you'd, if I got up at five to start writing, you'd find me at like 5.05 .05 with my head clunked against the computer, like dead asleep. Lee Child said, nothing good ever happens before noon. And that's sort of how I feel about writing. But I, in my books, um, I'm an investigative reporter, as you know, and my husband is a criminal defense attorney. And so there are times in my books which are somewhat legal oriented. They're not legal thrillers, but they live in that world where there's a legal question that I have. And for some reason, I always come up with this question that I need to know what would a prosecutor say or what would the rule be about this or how could a judge do that. It always sort of happens about three in the afternoon. That's sort of the writing cycle. So I call my husband at the office and I say, hi, sweetheart, it's me with the legal question of the day. Um, and then I, so it's really great to be living with a lawyer to have my own in-house counsel. That's really helpful. But the prosecutor or defense attorney, my new novel, which I guess I can tell you the name of, which was I sent, I hit send yesterday on it. Can you believe? 
uh, which was pretty great, at 11.58 p.m., because it was due Friday, you know, it was due by midnight, <laughs> is called The Murder List, and it is about a young law student who was caught between her husband, a defense attorney, and her boss, a prosecutor. So uh, you'll have to read that book to find out which is better. It's all, law is all about knowing the rules. Um, and which side you choose, you, both sides think they're the side of justice. So it just depends on how you think. We have a couple minutes, yes. Hi. Um, what would you, what would be your um, advice to me? I have someone very close to me who's writing a science fiction book and has asked me to read it, edit it, give me your opinion, and I just hate it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, Welcome to the world of having a friend who's a writer. You're, you're asking, you have a friend who wrote a book, and you just really don't like it. Is she or he here? No. <laughs> <laughs> I might watch C-SPAN. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, there is always something good to be said about a book, even if it is, what a great idea that is. You don't have to finish with, wow, but you really didn't do a very good job. <laughs> with that. At, you can tell what you really think. I didn't understand this part. I didn't understand that part. But wow, what a good idea. You're not going to, you know, when you read reviews and it, somebody says five stars and somebody says one star and it's the same book, you know, you realize that there's room for many different opinions in the world. And some, you know, my husband and I can read two, the same book and I love it and he doesn't love it. So it's okay not to like it. And you're, she's or he is your friend. Tell them something good about the book and point them with some constructive criticism perhaps about what you thought could be better. Like, I didn't really know where this was taking place. That would, that would, be, mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be a good thing. So it's a dilemma, and you're a good pal for caring about it. OK. Thank, thank you, you for the very good question. Last question. We have like a minute, I think, two? Two minutes. Two minutes. So you get to have some of it. Sorry, I'm really nervous. No, don't be nervous. Um, I'm, I have a couple of novels that I'm trying to finish, because I can never seem to let the characters go. How do you know when to end a novel? How do you know when to end a novel? She's saying that she's written a couple of novels and she can never let the characters go. I know exactly um, when I'm finished. And that is kind of a magical thing. You know how you revise and you revise and revise and you're looking at every, every word. And I do that so passionately because revision is the ball game. Every first draft is terrible. And then you work on it and work on it and work on it and try to find the book in there that you were really writing. And I remember with Trust Me, it happened. I was doing a revision and I was reading along and I forgot that I wrote the book. I realized that I was just reading this story um, and not trying to fix it anymore. And that's how I knew it was done. You're telling a story with a beginning, middle, and end. Is it good? Is it compelling? When you read it, do you love it? If you love it, then your readers will love it too. And then just stop and put it out in the world. Let, don't, don't keep that book a secret. Share that and let, that, let your book live. Thank you. Of course. Last question, real fast. You're a journalist. Uh, I'm a producer in TV news. You're looking, after, looking for the truth in your journalism. How do you not get bogged down in trying to respect facts and the truth when you're writing something that's not true, fiction? How do you not get bogged down in trying to respect one part of you and working on the other part? How do I get bogged down in writing fiction? Not get bogged down. Not get, yeah. How do I get bogged down? I can really tell you that. How do I, get, yeah. how do I not get bogged down yeah. in, the, in the facts? Yeah, in trying the to respect facts are... the facts in your research when you're writing oh. fiction. You know, when I, when I research, I put it all in my head, and then I just don't ever look at the research notebooks again. I just sort of consume this information and put myself in the place that I want the book to be, and then I just write it. So fiction is different, so different from, from doing journalism. So I try to just relax and let the book come out the best way that it can be. 
Um, it's, it's, it's fun. It, my job is to take a really complicated bunch of stuff and make it into a fascinating story. And that's what I try to do every day. I, I'm getting the wrap-up sign. Thank you so much. Let me just say, remember the last time you went to the library and you pulled out a book and you looked at it. Think about the author when you do that. When you go to a library and select a book and take it home with you, you have made an author, an author happy. And I am very grateful to be part of that world. Thank you so much for coming here today. <laughs>